Good morning, everyone. We're going to start both simultaneously a little late and a little early. Um, I will cede my opening remarks, though I, uh, I can just say again, I'm so grateful that you're all here. We've had a beautiful conference day yesterday. Um, I know I started by thanking the team here at the NOM Center. Now you've had a day to truly appreciate how amazing they are at running a conference, especially a hybrid one. So thank you again, team at the NOM Center. <laughs> And I'd like to just get straight into introducing our first panel for this morning, panel four, Food and the Heterogeneous Korean Identity. Um, this panel will be completely remote, so allow me to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker will be Won Jung Min, the uh, professor at two universities, the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and Seoul National University Asia Center. Se Jung Yang is an instructor at Jeju National University. Ju Young Lee is assistant professor at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies, and their talks will be um, discussed by Dr. Krishnandu Ray, a professor at NYU Steinhardt. So thank to all of our virtual discussants, or virtual participants for being here. Thank you all in the room, um, and thank those of you online who are watching. Um, and with all of those thanks, I welcome Dr. Min. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity. This is a exploratory study and your feedback is valuable. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. The globalization has contributed not only to closing geographical distances, but also to closing the distances between cultures gaps that have been narrowing at an accelerating rate with the, the spread of the internet. Nevertheless, South Korea is not yet uh, viewed in as successful Latin America. Despite the increased diplomatic and economic changes, bridging geographical and cultural distance is not easy. Just as South Koreans see Latin America as a single entity, Asia and Latin America is often represented in the region as a single Asia or in most cases, cases, China. While the Korean wave in Latin America has been reported intermittently in Korean media, accurate information on local perception is difficult to obtain. When a K-pop group performed in several Latin American countries, local media covered the idols, visits, and concerts, but a more vigorous research is required to analyze the context behind the news. However, there are not many studies on the Korean web Latin America, and most studies have characterized Latin American fandom as middle and lower class teenage girls. Recent studies on K-pop fandom in Latin America have pointed out escapism, orientalism, and shy confession, among other elements. This is related to Eurocentrism and to Chinoism, which understands Asia as China in Latin America. However, it is true that interest in culture is gradually increasing with economic exchange. For example, a sushi boom began to blow in Chile a few years ago, and Korean restaurants once only present in Koreatown have been to appear elsewhere in cities. Without question, food is one of the main elements of a culture. In news articles and media reports about Korean food have started to appear. Considering the Eurocentric prejudice and racism in Latin America, uh, this study aims to examine the influence of Eurocentrism and Chinoism on the consumption and reception of Korean food in Chile. Since it would have impossible, it would be impossible to cover the entire West Latin American continent in an ex ex examination of the consumption and reception of Korean cuisine, this study will focus on Chile. Among the 33 countries in the region, Chile was the first to sign a free trade agreement with South Korea. More recently, Chile has come to be known as the hub of K-pop fandom in Latin America. Interest in Korean pop culture seems to have led to an attraction to Korean cuisine as well. Just as most fans came to know K-pop through Japanese anime or manga, Korean cuisine seems to have become popular in Chile following a similar pattern. However, 
The cultural bias that views all of Asia as Chinese has affected Korean food consumption. For example, when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, documents called Wuhan soup spread through social media all over South America. In Latin America, COVID-19 was soon recognized as a Chinese virus. Furthermore, a sandwich shop in Santiago drew the outreach of K-pop fans by putting up a sign saying, Korean sandwich, bad meat not included. The study will thus analyze the increase of media reports on the topic and attitudes contained therein with a focus on newspaper and magazines articles as well as on TV documents. Chilean cuisine stems out from the combination of traditional Spanish cuisine, Chilean Mapuche culture and local ingredients with later important influences from other European cuisines, particularly from Germany, the United Kingdom and France. The food tradition and recipes in Chile are notable for the variety of flavor, flavors and ingredients with the country's diverse geography and, and climate hosting a wide range of agricultural produce, fruits and vegetables. The long coastline and the people's relationship with the Pacific Ocean add an immense array of seafood to Chilean cuisine with the country's waters a home to unique species, species of fishes, mollusks, crustaceans, and alga. Thanks to the oxygen-rich water carried in by the Humboldt Current, Chile is also one of the world's largest production of wine, and many Chilean recipes are enhanced and accompanied by local wines. The confection dulce de leche was invented in Chile and is one of the country's most notable contributions to world cuisine. Recent immigrants from neighboring countries in the region have also changed the Chilean table. However, social perceptions of them are quite different from those of European immigrants. The central idea is that Chile is a country different from the rest of Latin America, a country with European features where things go seriously. Chile cont contrasts this with the difficult of difficulties of its neighbors, which are attributed to political disorder and bad economic policies. The decision to display an iceberg at the World Cup exhibition in Seville in 1992 symbolized the cool country exempt from all tropicalism. Traditional class consciousness based on skin color has continued to this day. Colonial careers formed an oligarchic after independence and became today's elite. The construction of narrative around the national identity has been based on the mythology of origin the predominance of the white over the non-white, a mythology that from the exclusion of the indigenous and the denial of mestizaje translated into a hidden, latent, disguised and ubiquitous racism present at all levels of society and permanently accompanying social stratification. Racism was thus installed in the collective unconscious of the country, closely linked to the process of formation of the state which culminated in part with the uh, usurpation of Mapuche territory between 8080 and 83 through a military eruption undertaken by the emerging Chilean state. Miscegenation uh, has undoubtedly been a re reality throughout Chilean history, even concealed among the effectively mestizo population. From the paradigm of the white and the non-white, to speak of misadization is to pronounce on a mixture that appears attenuated or erased by the permanent exercise of whitening that the leading groups have adopted, the intellectuals and politicians since ancient times. Chilean society tends to be stratified according to quite distinct socioeconomic groups. Indeed, one's socioeconomic status is considered to be a major determinant of one's identity. The importance of social class is reflected in the various Chilean words used to describe one's social position. Chilean society has experienced a significant change in the last five years with the arrival of immigrants from countries such as Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, Peru and Bolivia and Colombia, among others. Upon arriving in Chile, many of these migrants work in unskilled jobs or trades usually associated with the lower social class such as cleaning, waitressing, domestic work, and uh, street vending, despite having high levels of education. 
This migration has stressed the living conditions for many Chilean families already living in poverty, resulting in the emergence of a new social class, the middle low class. The relationship between skin color and class has also influenced the prejudice against Asian immigrants, as this relationship leads to the division of cultural capital and cultural consumption according to class. I hypothesize that this distinction affects the consumption of Asian food, including Korean food. Asian immigrants are few in number. South Korea and Chile established a diplomatic relationship in 1962 and signed an FTA in 2003. Despite the solid diplomatic, political, and economic ties between Chile and Asia, these relations have not engendered much understanding of Asian cultures among Chileans, and Asian populations in Chile remains rather small. Unlike European migration, Asian immigration in general was neither planned nor desired. Neither did Asian immigration coincide with the racial ideal postulated by the ideologies of 19th century Latin American society, including Chile. Korean immigration to Chile began during the regimes of Park jong hee in South Korea and Augusto Pinochet in Chile from 1973, when both countries were under dictatorships. The Park jong hee government encouraged the immigration of Koreans to the New World, and the Pinochet government adopted the neoliberal policies that aimed to promote Chile's economic development and thus received investment in immigration. Several interesting media reports have dealt with Korean immigrants in Chile, and they give some insight into how Chilean society perceived the Korean community. In 2008, the Chilean National Library Congress covered the conference in the Korean community in Latin America that was held at the University of Chile in Santiago. The report cited the presentation by Professor Martin Perez Lufort, and he described a causal factors in immigration from Korea to Chile. First, there was American dreams with a layover in Latin America before emigrating to the United States. Second, authoritarian governments in the 1960s restricted political and civil freedom, though I do not agree with this opinion. And third was the encouragement of the, by both the Chile and South government, dictatorial governments to increase immigration due to favorable economic factors abroad and to reduce in unemployment in Korea. Since K-pop has gained popularity among Chilean youth, Chilean media have sometimes covered the Korean community in Patronato. The Koreans who first arrived in Santiago mostly settled in Patronato, where Arabs called Turcos, or by Chileans in Turks in English, were located and ran their businesses. Koreans discovered this di district and began settling there as many of the Turcos had entered the Chilean mainstream and moved elsewhere. Patronato is known in Santiago as Little Korea and is recognized as a shopping district to buy cheap clothes. There are many wholesale stores run by different ethnic communities, mainly from Asia and the Middle East. The lives of early Korean immigrants in Chile was difficult due to geographical, cultural, and linguistic distances. According to the records of Koreans in Chile in 2014, Korean immigration in Chile in October 1991 were to be deported because the Chilean government rejected visa extensions for all Koreans in Chile. Through the efforts of Cardinal Kim Soo-hwan and the South Korean government, the Korean community in Chile was able to surmount this challenge. Koreans also suffered direct racial discrimination uh, in March 1992, a Korean woman named Jae Jin Yu was voted out of the spa called Piscina Munt, located in Santiago, for her nationality. The reason given was that Koreans supposedly emanate bad odors due to their diet. Ms. Yu demanded 50 million Chilean pesos for racial discrimination, and the court awarded her 5 million pesos. Later, Ms. Yu attorneys reported that his client decided to donate the sum to families affected by the weather in some southern part of Chile. Today, most of Chile's Koreans run their business in Patronato. Some of them still live near, uh, live near their business though many have moved to a more expensive residential area. According to the Overseas Korea Foundation 2017 report, 
almost about 2,500 Koreans live in Chile, while amounts of 22.47% of all overseas Koreans. This number includes people with permanent residence, students studying in Chile, surgeoning employees and their families, and Chilean nationality holders. The report underlines that the number of surgeoning employees and students studying in Chile has been decreasing in recent years. All Asians are in Chile are considered chinos. The term chinito surely implies a derogatory meaning, but at the same time, chinito is used with a flattering nuance. The first Asian and Latin American or Chinese laborers who came to Chile during the Pacific War between Chile and the Peru-Bolivia coalition in 18th, 19th century. Today, China, Japan, and South Korea are major economic partners of Chile. However, economic ties and cultural awareness are separate issues. Although there are neither many Asians nor much awareness of Asia in Chile, Asian pop culture has permeated Chilean society starting with Japanese anime and manga in the 1990s. K-pop fandom began to emerge in the 2010s. Interestingly, despite the chronological gap between the influx of Japanese and Korean pop culture, Chilean society as a whole views both as Chino cultures, although very few people consume Chinese pop culture. The Japanese anime and manga fan base formed a subculture group called Chilean Otaku, which influenced the spread of K-pop. Most Chileans came to know K-pop through Japanese anime and manga. Japanese anime, manga, and K-pop are considered the supports of Chino culture in Chile. The racial, is opera, uh, the racial issue operates not only in class and masculinity. The complex of the class structures reflect, uh, refers to the relationship between existing groups and class structure itself, for instance, professionally and economically. This shows the importance of considering subjective aspects that manifest the multidimensionality of the class concept in Chile. From this no notion of taste and distinctions regarding the consumption of cultural products uh, according to class are also present and many explain differences in taste for Asian cultural products such as anime, manga, and K-pop according to social class. Bordio established that all cultural practices and their corresponding preference, preferences are closely linked, first to education level and second to social origin. Therefore, socially recognized hierarchies in the arts correspond to a social hierarchy of consumers, which pre, uh, predisposes taste to function as a market of class. There is a correspondence between works in the field of cultural production and the positions of the consumers in the social space, which means that for certain types of products, there is a certain type of public with a particular place, not only in the field of cultural production, but also in society. This may explain why the consumption of Asian cultural products is hidden among Chileans from more affluent classes. A taste for manga, anime, and K-pop would not fit the norms of, of their social class. Despite the social prejudice, Chilean-style Asian food combined with Orientalism has been gaining popularity as a well-being boom has recently begun in Chilean society. A few years ago, mm -hmm, uh, uh, sushi began to gain popularity. Chilean sushi is often served with avocado, salmon, and quesillo cheese, and is eaten with plenty of wasabi and soy sauce. Vegetarianism and veganism are also on the rise. While it is difficult to find tofu other than in Chinese and Korean marts, which are rare in downtown Santiago, dry tofu and expensive raw tofu are starting to appear in the cheese section. Tofu is expensive enough to satisfy the well-being needs of the upper class. Along with this, the popularity of the Korean wave is led to introduction to Korean food often appearing in the media. News about Korean restaurants appearing in document style reports or weekend magazine edition of women's magazines mainly provide information of novel dishes. Not long ago, news about a Korean a food festival held in Santiago uh, trying to connect the Korean food, K-pop, K-beauty, and Korean tradition, which are trying to... Uh, well known or bad had no connection in Chilean society until a few years ago. 
At the same time, by showing the chef of a Korean restaurant in Japanese clothes or a photo featuring all of the Korean, Chinese, and Japanese food, uh, a, a media reports uh, sympathize with people's Chinoism. Uh, red bean being so sold at Korean bakeries and cafes, which have recently appeared, is loaded with sweet fruits and condensed milk that many Chileans like. Korean food remains unfamiliar to Chilean society. There is also prejudice that Korean food can be distinguished from Chinese and Japanese food due to its piquancy. Eurocentrism and Chinoism have also been the cause of events such as Wuhan soup and bat sandwiches in the COVID-19 situation. There are not many studies on Asian food in Latin America yet among them. There are very few on the position of Korean food in Chilean society, where the Korean diaspora is not large. This presentation represents a pilot to continue this research in the future, both quantitative and qualitative research, uh, exploring Chile's reception attitude of other cultures and Chilean cuisine culture should be conducted in the future. Thank you very much. Taejong, we can see you and, and we can see your presentation and all that. Okay, cool. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sejong Yang from Jeju Island, and I'm in Jeju right now. And the time here is uh, almost 11.40 p.m. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I'd like to thank uh, Director Ryu and Dr. Worsi and also Kate uh, for inviting me to this delicious uh, conference. Uh, because of this participation, I was able to start this um, wonderful project uh, documenting uh, traditional recipes of Jeju food. So here is a picture of 90-year-old Jeju lady and her 60-year-old daughter making bing together. Uh, it was the daughter's first time making bing, actually. Um, although bing is a traditional Jeju food, uh, it is not being transmitted to the next generation at home. Uh, that's why it was their first time uh, teaching and learning how to make bing at their home. And during the process, the mother said, as you can see uh, underneath the picture, uh, during the process, uh, the lady said that, um, So if you are learning Korean or uh, if you are native speakers of Korean, you can have a guess what it means. Uh, let me uh, read it again. Uh, uh, actually, it means uh, people eat being because of its bug with uh, smell or aroma, right? And uh, it is quite understandable if you uh, didn't understand uh, what it means, uh, because uh, this is uh, the Jeju language, uh, which is unintelligible to uh, monolingual Korean speakers, and it can be uh, even more difficult to uh, Korean uh, learners. And however, the bigger issue is that uh, this language is not being transmitted to the younger generation uh, at home, just like uh, food. And therefore my project has evolved uh, from the recognition of the Jeju local food and language endangerment, uh, which can affect negatively to local identity and sustainable cultural uh, development in Jeju. Now, let me introduce you uh, what bing is. Um, bing is Jeju traditional buckwheat wrap uh, filled with uh, seasoned radish. And um, it has um, 
you can, as you can see, uh, we use very, um, you know, simple uh, ingredients, uh, buckwheat flour, radish, green onions, salt, sesame seeds, uh, and some oil. Um, to make bean, first, you need to chop the radish into strips, just like number one, and then you boil them with some salt, uh, and then you mix them with the chopped green onions and some sesame seeds, uh, then the filling is ready, just like number one, two, and three. And then uh, number four, um, after that, uh, you mix the buckwheat flour with some water and salt. Uh, then you can spread the uh, batter on the frying pan. Uh, and, um, and when it's cooked, you can take it out um, on top of the bamboo basket. And then you just place the, the filling, the reddish filling on top of the pa pancake and you just simply roll it. And then number eight, just press the end, ends, uh, both ends of ping and then you can eat it. And as I mentioned, the main ingredient of bean uh, is buckwheat. And let me explain why buckwheat is so important uh, for Jeju Island. Um, Jeju Island was uh, formed by a volcanic activity. Um, therefore, um, unlike the mainland, uh, Jeju's land is unsuitable for rice paddies. Uh, therefore, rice was rare and very expensive. Uh, however, buckwheat grew fast and well in Jeju's barren land. Uh, as a result, uh, throughout unfortunate local historical events, uh, poverty and starvation, uh, buckwheat production played an important key for food security. And buckwheat is called momo in Jeju. Uh, so far, uh, some 34 uh, momo-based foods have been recorded in Jeju, while, while buckwheat was limited to a small number of foods on the mainland. And uh, Jeju is uh, still the largest producer of momo in Korea, in Korea. And a lot of people think that Gangwon province is the largest producer uh, because of makgeokgu, uh, buckwheat noodles, and also Lee Hyo Seok's uh, famous novel uh, uh, called um, uh, when buckwheat uh, flowers bloom. Uh, because of those two things, uh, people um, in general think that Gangwon province uh, must produce a lot of um, momo, uh, but actually it's Jeju Island. Uh, in 2019, uh, Jeju produced uh, 974 tons, uh, which accounted for 36% of the country's uh, total uh, production of uh, buckwheat. and the origin of Momo and Ping. And um, although there are no clear written records of uh, when buckwheat was first introduced to Jeju, uh, Jeju shamans sing about the origin in the story of Cho Cheng Bi. And Cho Cheng Bi was a girl who was uh, brave and suffered through various hardship. And at the end, uh, she was finally recognized by the heavenly emperor and was given uh, momo seeds and brought them back to Jeju Island and became the uh, agricultural goddess in Jeju. And um, the picture shows a uh, Jeju shaman performing a ritual singing about Cho Cheng Bi. And here we have another picture showing the momo seeds, buckwood seeds. and the origin in folklore. Um, another source of the origin of Momo and being can be found in folklore in uh, Jeju community. Uh, people say that Momo was brought to Jeju Island uh, by Mongols uh, during the time when Jeju was under the direct control of the Mongols, uh, according to the folklore um, as a ploy to weaken uh, the power of Jeju men and uh, to increase the number of Mongolian clans uh, they built buckwheat fields uh, in the vast mid mountainous area. And Momo was believed to uh, dry up the Yangi, muscular energy, uh, if it was consumed daily as a staple food. Uh, for that reason, uh, Jeju people planted nompi, which means radish, uh, for its detoxifying effect next to the Momo field and created bean. Then what does being mean? Um, there are multiple folk uh, etymologies. Uh, one popular belief is that uh, being originated from the mimetic word ping bing, uh, which is used to describe the rolling or gyrating motion uh, in the pan to spread better evenly with a little uh, in the preparation process, as you can see in the pictures. 
Another etymology involves the uh, pronunciation of the Chinese character pyeong. Uh, pyeong means uh, steamed or boiled cake, uh, which is known as duck in Korean. Uh, so somehow Jeju people pronounce this as uh, ping instead of pyeong. So now you must all be uh, curious about the taste of bing if you have never tried this before. Um, I don't want to disappoint you, but uh, I have to uh, tell you that uh, bing is very notorious for uh, its bland taste for first eaters. Uh, in addition, uh, it is not that attractive to visually because of its dull color, uh, its gray color. Um, Finally, uh, even for Korean people, uh, they would not understand what being means, right? If they hear uh, the word being for the first time. Then why do we study being, right? Uh, despite Bing's flavorless taste and all those uh, complaints, uh, Bing's uh, uniqueness as local food has been recognized in multiple times. Uh, first, uh, Bing was nationally announced as one of uh, the th uh, 303 uh, Jeju local foods in 2008. And also it was uh, locally elected as one of the top seven unique local dishes uh, in 2013. Um, then what could be the reason that Bing has been recognized as a representative food of Jeju? Uh, one of the reasons for the recognition was Bing's cultural significance. Uh, unlike other regions in Korea, uh, Bing was prepared uh, widely as one of the food offerings for Shikke, which means uh, ancestral uh, memorial ritual. Uh, that's Chesa in Korean. And also uh, it was prepared uh, for weddings and funerals. So as you can see in the pictures. And let me tell you more about Jeju Island. Um, before Jeju Island became known for its natural beauty, uh, it was the most uh, underdeveloped region in Korea until the 60s. Uh, from the 70s, uh, tourism development uh, was promoted uh, by the central government. Uh, by the 80s, uh, Jeju was recognized as a tourist destination. Uh, and then it started to be called as Korea's Hawaii. Uh, so Jeju food began to um, transform into food for tourists. Uh, in the 90s, uh, the consumption of rice, animal products, and processed foods increased uh, dramatically. And finally, in the 21st century, uh, with the sudden economic development and increasing freedom, uh, Jeju locals no longer choose traditional Jeju foods, including ping. Uh, as a consequence, uh, traditional recipes are not being transmitted uh, to the next generation in the family. Uh, in addition, uh, as of 2021, uh, Jeju had the highest obesity rate in Korea. One of the causes must be the result that traditional food became disrupted. Um, although Jeju has become the number one tourist destination in Korea, uh, Jeju traditional local food in general has never received much attention and even got criticized for its low quality and low awareness. Uh, as a result, uh, previous studies have focused on how to improve its quality, awareness, and appeal to tourists. Uh, however, I believe uh, these tourist-oriented studies have ignored local uh, perspectives and resulted in hindering uh, Jeju's sustainable cultural development. Uh, therefore, the purpose of the current uh, case study of being is to explore uh, the significant cultural meaning of being, which can directly influence the local identity through uh, local uh, voice. Um, in July this year, I visited uh, the Jeju traditional five-day market to begin my field work. Uh, there was a vendor who was uh, selling yellow bean, uh, which differs from the traditional gray bean. Um, he said uh, his yellow bean was corn and wheat uh, flour based, uh, and it is more delicious uh, than the traditional one, which is buckwheat based. Uh, so I don't know how many people are in the audience, but I would like to ask everybody, <laughs> which one would you like to eat? Type A, the yellow one, or type B, the gray color one? 
So maybe you can decide. Um, actually, the vendor mentioned that uh, Jeju people only eat buckwheat-based bean, whereas tourists go for uh, his yellow bean. Um, so he seemed very confident about his ability to identify Jeju locals by bean choices. Um, so this short anecdote actually indicates how people in general use food preferences uh, to separate one group from, from others. So earlier I mentioned that uh, first eaters, uh, you know, think that uh, ping is tasteless. Um, however, Jeju local food exper experts, uh, they argue that uh, the blend taste is actually addictive. Uh, it is the taste of home for those who grew up eating it from childhood, uh, therefore without understanding the sentimental value of being and the lifestyles of Jeju locals, uh, one cannot truly enjoy its taste and cannot be said that uh, she or he is uh, a Jeju local. Um, I believe that this is a very powerful comment and as because it's saying that the being consumption uh, can determine who you are. <laughs> so everyone uh, here said uh, they like to try type B, I see. <laughs> Thank you. So I just checked the uh, uh, message just now. Okay, so you guys are definitely tourists. <laughs> and um, let me talk more about local food and local identity. Um, so there is no doubt uh, that local food is one aspect of culture that demonstrates how the identity of groups and communities is tied to geography and food. And in addition, uh, particular food preference uh, separates certain individuals, groups, and communities uh, from others while fostering solidarity among uh, those who share similar eating habits, uh, values, and beliefs. However, uh, the significant meaning of local food can change under the influence of various historical, social, and cultural issues affecting individuals or groups' motivation for food choices. Because of the complex relationship between local food and local identity, uh, it requires careful um, observation and explicit uh, explanations from individuals and groups in order to understand the dynamic nature of the two concepts. Uh, one promising way to investigate the complexity is to use linguistic data. According to Long, uh, the significant meaning of food can be explicit and be able to pass down to the next generations through language. Uh, therefore, uh, in the uh, field of linguistic anthropology, food culture or food waste has been analyzed on the basis of linguistic data ranging from lexical items and personal narratives. Um, to bring local perspectives in this study of local food, uh, linguistic data were collected during the fieldwork in July 2022 this year. A total of 12 Jeju locals aged between 53 and 90 participated in casual conversations. Uh, they were all uh, born in Jeju and raised in Jeju. Okay, five minutes remaining. <laughs> Thank you. Right, and so um, I audio taped everybody's conversations and the audio recorded conversations were transcribed for qualitative analysis to explore the memories, knowledge, and emotional and sensory feelings of the Jeju residents toward being. Uh, the comments of the locals were categorized into uh, similar topics and analyzed at three different levels, uh, historical and cultural, physical and emotional and sensory feelings. Results, uh, although some individual differences were found, common memories, knowledge, and beliefs have been identified. So first at the historical and cultural level, uh, here are some example utterances. Um, uh, first, uh, Mr. Song said, there is probably no one who hasn't eaten being among the elderly. Uh, Ms. Kang said, when we were young, we prepared ping for chesa. 
and Ms. Kang said, people brought ping offerings uh, only to their close relatives and siblings. Uh, that was considered a very thoughtful action. And Ms. Kim said, my sisters-in-law brought a charong a basket uh, full of ping. And uh, Ms. Kang said, the reason why people in the past made chonggi, uh, which means ping, a lot was uh, because it cost less than making other kinds of rice cake. And Ms. Kang said, after Chesa, uh, I put the off off offerings, uh, including ping, on the wooden tray and ate them together. Uh, when people left, I gave them some food wrapped in paper. Based on the utterances, uh, the following three points were found in relation to the historical and cultural level. Uh, they are uh, being is offered to uh, ancestors, and it was also used in weddings and funerals in some villages. And uh, the role of Jeju women was crucial for its production and sharing. And finally, Jeju community was connected uh, through its reliance on being. Uh, at the physical level, uh, the following utterances uh, were identified. Uh, Ms. Kang said, uh, you have to stir the batter for a long time until there are no lumps in the batter. And Ms. Ko said, radish is good in winter. And Ms. Chung said, when um, uh, stirring batter, uh, tangerines must not uh, near. And Ms. Han said, uh, the, the ends uh, of being should be pressed or closed. And Ms. Chang said, uh, Jeonbyeong on mainland Korea can be made with uh, wheat flour, but here, if you make ping with uh, wheat flour, it is no longer being. Based on the uh, participants' comments, uh, some important physical features of ping were found. And they are uh, the use of buckwheat and radish harvested in the winter, having certain shapes, for example, with the ends uh, of being should be pressed, and the use of particular cooking methods, such as you have to stir better until all the lumps are gone, and using lard and removing citrus fruits. And lastly, at the emotional and sensory level, the following kinds of utterances were also identified. And first, Mr. Ms. Kim said, I didn't used to like it because uh, because of its bland taste, but as I got older, I started to like it. And Ms. Chung said, uh, when I was younger, I hated radish, but now that I'm older, I like it. And Ms. Chun said, it tastes fresh and mild. And Ms. Kang said, um, uh, people eat ping because of momorne, uh, which is the smell of uh, buckwheat. Uh, that's what we say, delicious. And Ms. Kang said, um, my children brought me ping from a traditional market, but it didn't have momorne, um, the smell of uh, buckwheat, because it was mixed with, with flour. And um, Ms. Chung said, it is best to eat uh, with solani. And Mr. Hong said, when you chew bean, the aroma of radish and its taste should uh, linger in your mouth. Based on the utterances, uh, the following emotional and sensory feelings of bean were summarized. Uh, first, Momo Ne uh, defines good taste. Uh, the harmonious taste of buckwheat and radish is important. Solani, grilled Thai fish, uh, goes well with bean because of its salty nature. And finally, the ability to enjoy the mild, fresh, and harmonious taste comes later in life. In conclusion, uh, the aim of uh, the current study was to address uh, the significant meaning of a single local food being through language in relation to change uh, local identity. Uh, the major contribution of the present uh, research is that it provides an in-depth uh, discussion of that uh, food through the voice of Jeju locals and a background study of Jeju local history and food culture. Uh, Jeju has gone through various social, historical, and cultural changes. Uh, maintaining local identity and sustainable cultural development are crucial for solidarity and well-being in these rapidly changing times. An obvious challenge of the island's focus on entertaining tourists who have no local knowledge or memories of Jeju. Uh, this study has uh, shown a uh, potentially important work needs to be done on uh, how local values and uh, experiences which can possibly be transmitted to the next generation through both language and the practice of local traditional food production, uh, consumption and distribution. Thank you very much.
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? This is Krishnandu. We can hear you. Perfect. Good. Um, first, uh, uh, as you can probably guess from my background, I'm in a hotel room in New Orleans, uh, attending the American Studies Conference. Uh, and and uh, but I've read uh, all the papers uh, uh, with great pleasure and learned much. Uh, we have about 40 minutes for my uh, discussion uh, comments and questions. And uh, then uh, for your uh, comments and questions, which you should post in the QA, uh, Q&A channel. Uh, uh, to start off with, uh, first, thank you, Rory, for inviting me. Um, I have really learned a lot. Uh, and my comments today are going to come from the perspective of a cultural sociologist and a food studies scholar who will tend to be more comparative uh, than a Korean studies scholar. And part of my limitation, of course, is I do not know the language. So my commentary will be a lot more conceptual, epistemic uh, comments and comparative comments. Uh, so I'm going to start off in the order of the presentation. Um, so I'll start off with Professor Min's um, commentary on high low cuisine and Orientalism in Chile, which is very intriguing to me. Uh, in a number of ways that uh, that South Korean food is not yet visible uh, in in urban Latin American culture in terms of there's a mutual in invisibility and uh, unspecificity. And I really like uh, your uh, conception of Eurocentrism, Orientalism, and Chinoism, right? I have never used that term. And I think that's a very productive term uh, to think about this flattening of all of East Asia uh, into, into one place. Uh, and the second thing that I find intriguing and promising is uh, how the attitude, at least the urban elite professional classes attitude, uh, would, uh, would it or would it not change towards Korean food in its convergence with health, vegetarianism, veganism, and the way you gesture uh, towards uh, tofu. Um, given that, my broader comments and questions is this. I'm coming from, my work has mostly been in New York City, in, in, in the US from a transnational perspective. And in New York, this is, your presentation was very intriguing to me because in New York City, my data analysis of Zagat, Yelp, and Michelin shows that nothing is becoming more visible at, in terms of prestige, if price is a surrogate for prestige, than Korean food over the last 40 years, okay? And that's kind of, uh, uh, so uh, and to give you a specific example, I just did a data analysis of Michelin. Michelin has been in New York City since 2006. And I looked at 2006 and every Michelin until 2022 this year. No other cuisine has climbed so fast in the Michelin Guide than Korean food. And to give you an example, there's a four-fold increase of Michelin New York City coverage of Korean food. And if you look at New York Times coverage, we have recently, over the last month, had uh, two full two spread uh, paid spreads on Korean food. So uh, and 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 so for me, the question then is, I'll, I'll list my questions. And we can decide to either uh, answer these uh, or I can go on with my comments on the other papers and then we can answer at the answer or respond. You don't have to, these are not questions that can be answered directly. So my first question is this, it might be worth digging into, uh, which, you, which you mentioned, the Chilean urban reception of Japanese, especially upscale sushi. By the way, in New York City, upscale sushi climbed the fastest. Even today, the median price of upscale sushi in New York City Michelin Guide market is at $200, $295, way above French, continental, New American, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very interesting question if Korean food is going to follow the trajectory of upscale Japanese uh, in, in, say, Santiago, Chile, or is it going to be in a completely different trajectory that might have something to do with the food, that might have something to do with the people, that might have something to do with kind of 
the sociology of the people. Second, um, uh, your, your present, uh, Professor Mint's presentation poses the question, which is when do racial and orientalist hierarchies crumble or at least come into conflict with the hard and soft power of emerging nations such as South Korea? Okay, and, the, and for me, the New York City example is an example of either a reconfiguration of Orientalism and a racialist hierarchy or a crumbling of it, okay? And, 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 and one would have to theorize about it. And of course, the question related to that is, do they ever crumble or are they reconfigured in kind of new and interesting ways? And the last question or comment uh, to Professor Min is, um, what might be, uh, the, because you referenced uh, Bertia so much, what might be the relationship between the circulation of cultural capital among global networks of tastemakers and chefs. By the way, New York City chefs, even if they're not Korean, they're very excited about Korean foods and techniques. Uh, in some ways, not that different uh, from say, uh, people writing in English literature about say, Indian writing in English, right? Say Amitabh Ghosh and others. So there's obviously a circulation of what used to be subaltern categories in the network of cultural capital globally and, and, uh, uh, and, and how they express uh, in national urban settings like in Santiago, uh, Chile. So that completes my comment uh, on Professor Min's presentation. Professor Min, would you like to respond now quickly or should I go on with the other? Uh, whatever you want. Thank you so much for your comments and questions. Actually, this topic is not familiar for me. So, but I like to, I like this topic. So it's uh, actually my topic of interest is the reception and consumption of K-pop and otaku culture in Spanish speaking world in base, uh, based on their identity. And the thing is that the first occurrence is very, uh, very interesting because when I interviewed the Japanese anime and manga fans and K-pop fans, okay. almost one, yeah, uh, most of the Korean K-pop fans are at the same time fans of Japanese fans, but the Japanese anime fans are not necessarily fans of K-pop. The mm -hmm. urban elite high class, the more high class, they try to dis differentiate them from K-pop class because when they eat, when they uh, enjoy Japanese pop culture, and then when they eat the sushi, like Chilean style sushi, they feel cool. They feel very high class. But in the case of K-pop or Korean food, most of the restaurants are located in Patronat, the Korean village is not a very, like a, a kind of a Harlem in New York. I see. So I a see. kind of differences. And the second question, the racialism and orientalism, hard and soft to power. Actually, uh, as a Korean, being a Korean, I don't, because most of the, the Korean embassies in Latin American countries, they hold like a K-pop cover dance festivals. And then I don't think it's a very good idea for to promote the soft to power of Korea, actually because the urban high elite class consider the K-pop fans as middle lower class. Actually, that's why I mentioned shy confession because when I interviewed high class K-pop fans, they try to negate their fandom of K-pop because they do not want to be seen as K-pop fan as middle lower class. Yeah, I think what you're like, saying maybe in different parts of the field the way right. capital, cultural capital works is different. Right, the cultural mm -hmm. capital is different. And then actually in, in Chile, as well as other Latin American countries, like it, it's not easy to consume the same cap cultural capital be among classes because effort like an expensive and then the cost and then the like a kind of a cultural segregation between classes. So they enjoy different kind of culture. So, uh, well, actually the Michelin chart, I've not seen a lot in Chilean cases. And then a kind of a network is like a segregation. They are, they feel networked among their, between the, among their classes. So, uh, so like that kind of cultural capital or cultural network circulation is not easy. 
between different classes. But thank you so much for your question. I'd that's like good. to read your papers. Yeah, that's, this is very good. And in fact, I'm going to move on to Professor Young, and maybe we will come back to some of these questions and thoughts about it. Uh, so uh, again, I learned a lot, uh, Professor uh, Yang's paper uh, uh, about, in fact, uh, uh, heritage and heritage making. So again, like my previous comments, a lot of it is going to be mostly conceptual and comparative and a bit epistemic. Um, um, so uh, Professor Yang, you, uh, it might be worth thinking some more about the historical breaks in the making of a heritage. You, you already gestured towards, you point to uh, four, point, four three events, you point to Korean War, you point to 1990s. Uh, by the way, I'm responding to the paper that I read uh, and some of that may have been underlined in different ways. And, and I was, uh, you know what I was really intrigued by? Your second slide, which is an electric griddle, okay? To make the bing. So when does that come in? That surely changed the narrative materiality and symbolically of that story, or in fact, as it happens in a lot of heritage making, all those, dis all those disruptions and difference are repressed, okay? To create a kind of homogeneity of an eternally lasting heritage, okay? And so, uh, so uh, it would be fun and it would be interesting to pay greater attention to the relationship between infrastructure and culture, whether where the electric uh, griddle, in fact, gestures towards, right? We might have moved from wood to coal to electric, and, and, and yet we are claiming it's the same thing. Is it or is it not, okay? And one can do that with fat. And you, you already talk about it in the paper between lard and sesame oil, okay? And that's also true about water the source of water. Are they coming from wells? Are they coming piped in? Okay. And then of course, you also reference rice as a late addition. And, and uh, you, one can do that same thing to salt. Okay. Because the nature of the salt uh, changes. Uh, and, and you also gesture towards the use of hands and to eat and the use of chopsticks. Okay. So in some ways, this is in fact a fascinating story that everything changes, but nothing changes, okay, in, in some ways. And I think it's worth telling that story to the reader, how everything changes, yet nothing might change. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and one very dramatic case you point to is the association with Bing could be from a Mongol masculine food to a Jeju feminine that's a massive transformation, okay? How does that happen? How in some ways the thing remains the same and the thing is a totally different thing with the different kinds of infrastructure. So in some ways, how are commonalities expressed and, and differences and changes repressed, okay? Which is always the story I think of heritage making. And here I'll make my biggest conceptual point. A heritage is a view of the changing past from the changing present, okay? And a good interesting description would be defining these moments of transformation, these moments of change, and these moments of changes that are explained away. So I would love some more of the dis dissonant voices uh, 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 practices. And here it might be useful for you to engage with Barbara Cushenblatt Gimlet's work called Destination Culture, where culture is in fact a destination rather than something that has completely happened and finished in the past, okay? Especially in heritage making, okay? And, um, and you also point to, I'll give you another example. You point to differences between Northern, Western and Southern and Eastern uh, uh, practices. Uh, but in the narration and the presentation of the self to a tourist public, they, all those differences are elided away. So that itself, so my last comment here is think about it as uh, uh, to perform. To perform, as uh, Barbara Kirschenbach-Gimlet argues, is to do, is to do it right, 
and all these making the right kind of thing. Your, your commentators are repeatedly commenting on. And the final thing is to do it for a show. There's an audience, there has to be an audience, okay? So it'll be intriguing to see in your next set of field works to put your fingernails between these cracks uh, in the so-called continuous story to make it a very interesting story about heritage making. That's my set of comments. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Krishnendu, for your uh, fabulous comments. Um, now I have uh, more reason to go on uh, another field trip to find out more about what you have mentioned about, um, you know, especially uh, the timeline of uh, breaking the point where to determine the until when is the past and the until when is uh, in the now and future. And when we talk about the heritage, when is the time that I'm talking about, right? Um, so basically um, the timeline that I can think of right now would be uh, the 60s. Um, you know, we had um, Korean War um, in, in 1950 and until 60s, we, um, Jeju was the you know, poorest and underdeveloped uh, region. And then all of a sudden from the 70s, uh, we modernized uh, really fast because um, the central government wanted to uh, make us like tourism, uh, tourist destination. So every, everything just changed so much dramatically. So um, the electric uh, grill uh, that the lady was using, um, probably that one, uh, we started to use that um, uh, in the 90s. Uh, but um, from the 70s, maybe the kitchen um, facility was changed then um, instead of, um, you know, the wood to make fire, um, probably we started to have like a stove um, and um, the gas system in the kitchen from um, the 70s and 80s. And then um, we uh, started to use electric, um, you know, uh, tools uh, from the 90s. Um, so maybe the breaking point would be um, uh, the modernizing uh, breaking point would be uh, the ladies would be 70s. Yes. That's probably a generational thing, who you're into, who you're talking to, right? Yes. So, it's yeah. a, so heritage is a function of that contingent relationship of you and and who you are, who are your respondents are. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I think worth worth developing and thinking about. Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, one last set of comments to Professor Lee um, on the eating the other, uh, branding Korea, global television series that uh, Kimchi Chronicles. Uh, 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 I love your work. I love your rage about it. Uh, and that's a lot of the celebrity culture, okay? It's a peculiar form of appropriation. And I found it, in fact, my rage is more towards PBS now, which manufactured this as some authentic uh, a field trip and turns out to be, it was bought for about a, a billion bucks, uh, uh, you know? And that's a lot of money. Mm, that's a lot of money that a lot more things, better things could be done and giving the copyright to these celebrity stars. Uh, 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 and in fact, it forced me uh, to watch the Kimchi Chronicles paper, which I did uh, with increasing uh, uh, infuriation. Uh, so I have one uh, empirical question and then again, uh, mostly comparative uh, uh, conceptual question. Uh, in the paper, I think on the second page, you mentioned the Korean government uh, funded the series uh, for 1.2 billion. And today you mentioned 76 billion. Uh, so I want to just a, a clarification and which you can answer after I finish my comments, which is A, what's the currency you're talking about? Uh, 1.2 billion or 76 billion. And second, what's the source of that information? Because I think that's a very important information. Uh, so uh, you can just answer that empirical question at the end. Let me end with kind of two uh, uh, broader comments. Uh, one is uh, it could be very interesting to do a comparative analysis of this kind of attempt to project soft power that was done by Japan, okay? That was done by Italy, that was done by Thailand, continues, uh, and it, it, it partly 
there's an organic quality to how some of these cuisines become popular and how some of these cuisines become prestigious. But there's a lot of instrumentality to it. And what I like about your paper is that attention to that instrumentality, okay, uh, about it. But if uh, we compare the Korean case uh, to now the, the Thai case and the Jap Japanese case and the Italian case, what might it tell us about the relationship between hard power, soft power, cultural capital, you know, and, and that comparative work uh, uh, might be uh, productive. My second broader comment is this, and which also links to my comment um, with, with, the, uh, with the first paper, uh, which is that notwithstanding uh, your argument uh, about the failure of this particular project, uh, Korean cuisine is a very fast, as I said, climbing category in places like New York City. Okay, so how exactly do we judge success and failure of these kinds of instrumentalist projects? Do they have anything to do with it? Or is it that this is stuff people like, state bureaucrats like, it allows them to suck up to the uh, uh, president and the president's wife, uh, and in fact, that's a very different project, okay? And the project, the impact is not what happens. The impact is that they are doing it, okay? And the whole point of uh, that, uh, the, the, in some ways, it's a government mentality attitude, which is, does it make local bureaucrats look good in the eyes of the powerful? That's one function of these things, okay? But what might be its relationship to real organic seeping cultural power of certain forms of culture, certain material forms of culture, in this case, Korean food, that seems to be climbing in global cities. My data from New York City really underlines it, and it's not New York City, my data from LA underlines it. London, maybe not exactly in the same place, but it is also emerging in terms of global cities. So what? how might one evaluate, okay, this broader rise of, uh, 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 in terms of cultural capital of Korean cuisine in global cities uh, and unevenly, as we saw with the Santiago Chile case, say versus the New York City case versus the London case and how to tell that story. So I'll stop there. And we have about 17 minutes. Uh, for your response and then Q&A from the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray, for your insightful comment. About the number first, uh, the smaller number, uh, I am using one, so I need to clarify one. it's not okay. smaller. Okay. Not one. Okay. And then the smaller number is the spending that the government paid for the series, and the bigger number is for the whole project, the globalization of Korean cuisine project. Ah. Uh, Got it. So thank you so much for uh, that comment. I will clarify in my future paper. And then um, it is interesting because when this project first launched during Lee Myung-bak's uh, presidency, it was evaluated as a failed project because uh -huh. Korean food could not become popular in other countries during that time. And especially with this television series because of the copyright, Korean government could not bring money back from the United States for uh, rating. Therefore, a lot in many ways, it was viewed as a failed project. However, with the rise of K-pop and with uh, winning of Parasite uh, at Academy Awards, Japaguri, uh, one of the signature food in the film, Parasite, it became so popular in New York or Los Angeles and other kind of cities. So rather than thinking about this hard, hard power, the government is investment, sometimes uh, cultural popularity is coming from the bottom, the bottom up. So I think that we always need to think about whether the hard power can change the culture movement or not. We need to always think about how the local populations and uh, the bottom uh, can change the culture movement. Uh, 
So that's a brilliant. I, that's a brilliant response. Way to think about it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think that also answers your first question as well. So yep. thank you. Rory, you're going to say something, Rao, right? I'm not on. I'm not on mic yet. Oh, there, there we go. Now I can talk. Um, okay. First of all, thank you so much to our panelists and to Dr. Ray for being our fantastic discussion. That was a wonderful panel. It's not over yet. If anyone um, here in the room has a question, I want to ask to come forward and ask at the podium so our our panelists can see you while you ask. And online, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q and A. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the panelists. Uh, I really, really enjoy all the presentations. Uh, my question is addressed to uh, Professor Chu Yong Lee. And um, I myself actually watched this uh, Kimchi Chronicle with a great interest. And it was really fascinating to hear uh, your perspective, your interpretation from, uh, uh, from your analysis of Korean side, Korean government, and the Korean response to this uh, Kimchi Chronicle. And I think um, uh, it seems to be uh, really interesting to see, uh, to bring in uh, multiple players. Uh, for example, uh, Marjorie Bungri Chen actually mentioned that the way she got into this business or this project was actually coincidental. She happened to be dining at her husband's uh, French restaurant in New York City. Uh, and at the time, uh, one of the uh, Korean American producers were dining at the, at the time. So this is a Korean American producer's desire to introduce a Korean cuisine to the world. And then it happened to be Zhang Zhuji was there and the mother was there. So, so this, as she said, she just happened to be in the right time, in the right place. Uh, so that's kind of one element. And I think throughout the uh, uh, chronicle, she accompanied all these authentic Korean experts rather than she claim herself as an authentic voice of a Korean cuisine. So I'm just kind of curious how you understand uh, Marja Vungrichen's claim of authenticity uh, with some specific examples. Uh, in relation to that, uh, you also mentioned this is another kind of very uh, interesting, intriguing uh, argument. You mentioned othering Korea in this project. So um, in, order, in order to avoid othering Korea or in order to avoid appropriating uh, Korean culture, what other way could have been made uh, in the Chronicle? So, so I never already have some kind of uh, insights from those uh, points. That would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Herrte. Uh, I am going to start from the second question. So it looks like uh, Marja is using different ways to claim her authenticity in this series. The first one that I mentioned uh, as I presented, uh, she, was, she showed her biological families in the first and the last episode. And at the same time, she sometimes uh, walk around uh, Korean cities and talk a little bit of Korean uh, basic vocabularies and basic words. Uh, at the same time, she is also really emphasizing in the beginning of the show, she continuously shows her uh, younger age photograph uh, when she, before she was adopted to American family. So those are kind of ways to claim her authenticity. But at the same time, it was very weird to see Hugh Jackman or Heather Graham drop the show. Uh, Hugh Jackman, actually he is a uh, ambassador for Seoul uh, because his father used to be a accountant in South Korea. Um, and uh, I am not so sure why Heather Graham was in that show at the same time. So it would be much better since uh, since Korean American producer involved in this project, it would be much better to bring uh, other Korean American uh, adoptees or returnees to include in this show. And at the same time, including more uh, Korean cook and uh, experts uh, on Korean cooking as primary guests in this show, not to appropriate or otherize Korea. And at the same time, one very important thing is that 
when we think about appropriation, appropriating Black culture, appropriating uh, other culture, we always need to think about who is getting the culture capital, who is owning the culture capital. At the end, this show uh, ended up giving all the money back to Marja and PBS, not benefiting uh, Korean people or Korean cook or uh, those people who were selling street food on the street in South Korea. So that we, when we produce those kind of media products, it will be really important for us to include uh, uh, those people who are uh, on hands in those kind of uh, cooking or making food. Okay. So uh, thank you for wonderful um, set of presentations and, and uh, Dr. Ray's uh, wonderful, fabulous comments. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Min. And so um, you mentioned that this, the Korean government should not try to bring its, the power of its soft power uh, and um, organize things like K-pop cover dance, et cetera, et cetera. In Chile, because in, in some ways what it does is ends up reinscribing K-pop as sort of a low um, culture uh, consumed often by lower uh, masses rather than an, an elite culture such that um, otaku or even sushi eating seems to be uh, associated with. And I'm wondering, why not embrace it? Why not embrace K-pop as something that is massively popular among the non-high culture consumers uh, in Chile and use it as a, and, 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 and celebrate it and maybe use it, um, go off on it, riff on it. Um, so just a, just a ba very basic question about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh... It's an issue because I think that because Korean the K-pop is not the only one Korean culture. That's what I mean, because actually in cultural studies now the many Western uh, scholars uh, claiming uh, claim that the Korean popular culture have uh, obtained popularity thanks to the government's efforts and the Korean academics are objecting to that opinion. But when you live in the foreign country, living such as Chile, like Latin American countries, most of the K-pop fans consider the K-pop's popularity thanks to the government's efforts. So uh, that makes the foreign scholars to think that K-pop or Korean wave have obtained popularity thanks to the government's efforts. But I think the industry is industry and the culture flows and then you never know what fans consider. You never know what fans uh, like it or do not like it in the future. So I think just let them flow, that's what I mean. And then after, ever since the K-pop gained the popularity in Chile, because before K-pop, only Samulori, Pansori, the traditional culture exhibition came visit the Latin American countries. And after K-pop, they disappeared absolutely. And the only K-pop cover dance concert were held in Latin American countries organized by the Korean embassy. I don't think it's a good idea because to promote one culture or promote the careers or promoting K-pop or soft power or nation branding, you have to use a variety of culture. You have to try to show a variety of culture, diversity of Korean culture, not only K-pop, that's what I mean. Any questions for Professor Young? Hi, this was such a great panel. Where should I look? <laughs> um, I have a, prof a question for Professor Young about sort of the marketing of Memu broadly. Um, you know, I was in at the Pyeongchang Olympics, which was in Gangwon-do, and there was definitely a lot of marketing about you know the Memu guksu, the the buckwheat noodles, as sort of like a a local dish. And then I'm thinking about the Tokebi, the goblin drama that has these very dramatic scenes in the Memil um, fields. 
So I'm just wondering if like the popularization of buckwheat as sort of a Korean food is influencing Bing and how people think about, you know, not just Bing, but just sort of the use of buckwheat as uh, aspect as an ingredient in Korean cultural in, in food. Yeah. Yes, definitely uh, promoting uh, the consumption of buckwheat would be really good. Um, since uh, Jeju Island is producing a lot of um, you know buckwheat, and then we should be able to um, use that. Um, you know, agricultural uh, production uh, wisely. Um, and people should uh, notice that uh, it's health benefit as well. So uh, the way we can promote is, uh, you know, a lot of people want to go on a diet and then uh, buckwheat is a great source of, you know, um, source of um, when you go on a diet because it has a very low calorie and stuff like that. And also buckwheat is not not just good you know, for a consumption for your health benefit, but also you can um, create um, you know, other kinds of um, products uh, such as making um, pillows you know, to use. And um, in the past, Jeju people also uh, used to eat um, uh, you know, the, the plants itself as well. Um, it can be a great uh, you know, vegetable, can be great vegetables as well. And um, so why not uh, promote, um, you know, more, um, uh, you know, pr um, making more of products uh, out of buckwheat and uh, promote uh, for the consumption of buckwheat um, in Jeju and also Gangwon province. And then also add, um, you know, Jeju um, uh, uh, brand, uh, make a Jeju brand uh, to um, promote a more he healthier part of um, Jeju Island. Yeah, on that as well, we are waiting uh, just a couple of minutes, maybe other questions. I also hope we don't do to buckwheat what we did to quinoa, right? <laughs> Make it impossible for local people to have access when we overbrand it as superfood. I mean, always oh. the tragedy of it, right? Oh yeah, there, there is a complaint about locals saying that uh, Jeju buckwheat uh, is too expensive to exactly. actually uh, yes. So maybe it's good not to be too fashionable with our diets. <laughs> Any other comments while we're waiting? Do you have comments for each other? Thoughts on each other's papers or the oh. panelists? <laughs> it's a great, we can't acknowledge that it is 1 a.m. for our panelists right now. So ah, sorry, yes, <laughs> yes. Talking. Um, but really, thank you all so much, um, especially for showing up so late at night. Um, I, I truly appreciate it. It was wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, I will, we're, we're not 100% out of time, so I will pause for another question. We have a question. Thank you for these discussions. Um, my question is also for um, Professor Yang. And one of your slides pointed out some of the disruptions that you've seen in the local heritage and, and foods of Jeju Island. Um, and in particular, I noticed that you included processed food. And so I'm curious if you can give us any insight about you know, the other influences or perhaps generational differences and whether you're seeing the infringement of, of processed foods as more of a replacement of these local or historical and traditional foods, or is it more like an accompaniment where you see people um, eating them you know, together or simultaneously? Thank you. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, so um, Jeju Island has turned into um, like, I mean, it has been westernized a lot. So, um, for example, um, Bing is no longer uh, made uh, within um, in household anymore. Um, uh, they are actually replaced by um, westernized bread. So, when we have a rituals, uh, we used to uh, make beans, but uh, now being being all the bean um, you know, offering has been replaced by uh, Western style bread. And younger generations, uh, of course, they love pizza, hamburgers and sausages and stuff like that. And, um, and they probably, a lot of younger people that they don't even know what ping is. Um, that is, I think, uh, really, really, um, uh, you know, it's, it's 
becoming a problem because <laughs> uh, younger kids growing up without knowing uh, what their traditional foods are uh, in the future, uh, they will not be able to, uh, you know, make them at home or pass that their knowledge of uh, recipes uh, of, um, you know, to their children. So soon um, the recipes will be gone and then some of the great knowledge of, uh, from our ancestors will be gone. And then uh, basically um, having local, um, the local farming practice will be changed because if no one actually uses, like for example, buckwheat, uh, then buckwheat farming will be disappeared and, um, and we'll be like a, you know, relying on uh, importing a lot of um, uh, farming products from overseas. Um, but we have uh, experienced about, you know, during the COVID-19, uh, we could not, um, you know, import or export much. So having our own local um, farming products is very important. And then maybe at schools, um, you know, like teachers should be, you know, teaching uh, young children uh, traditional food, why we ate them uh, and why uh, we need to actually uh, promote having uh, uh, local products. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, panelists, for terrific papers and uh, suffering our questions at 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and uh, I think I uh, deserve a hand from the present audience there. Thank you. Thank you.